So we're going to just, uh, I want to start in the next few weeks, because the world is in chaos, and because you know the word, because you study the word, right? How do we apply the relevancy of what God's word says to the times we're living in now? I have heard my mother told me forever, Jesus is coming soon. Mom, get over it. I got to get married. I got to have some kids. I want a nice home. Mom, slow down. You've lived your life, Mom. Sounds familiar? Well, Mom ain't telling me the same thing anymore, and I ain't got no daddy telling me this stuff. My grandparents are all gone, and so is Paul and the disciples and all the apostles, and so is Martin Luther King, and so is all those who've gone who kept saying the same thing. Guess what? I am the last closest generation to the end. So now I'm trying to tell my kids. And now they're telling me, Daddy, I got to get married. And you know the feeling. It's a... But what they don't realize is what I know now, compared to what my mom knows, it's like night and day. If there were signs then, woo, we are beyond signs now. So I want to talk about the relevancy of our culture and the world at large in the next few weeks. But I want to introduce, just first of all, the idea that Jesus started the process of discussion. But what shall, when shall these things be? And it's called, now how many of you here are the theologians? I didn't think so. So let me break it down for you. How many of you study in some shape or form? So then most of you are ology. So far so good? Okay. How many of you serve God, study God, read about God in some shape or form? Well, his name is Theo. So most of you think that I was the only theologian. So I'm the only one studying about God? I'm the only one reading about God? That means all of us are theologians. Theologians. You are studying God in your life every day of your life. In your devotions, in your reading. Now some don't go as far as research or do eschatology or hermeneutics the way I may do. And some don't read other texts to try and get illumination to understand what the word is saying and where we are. But in the end, all of you are theologians. Just the same way all of you are disciples. Just the same way all of you are ministers. So stop relying on me and somebody else to tell you that you are somebody important in God's kingdom. And God wants to use you in this hour to transform a life that comes in contact with you that I will never see. Hello, somebody. So don't tell them I'm going to talk to the theologian. Tell them I am the theologian. And let your life become the model that will testify of the study of God. Yeshua HaMashiach, the Savior, Jesus Christ, and Jehovah, Elohim, God himself. Now, when we talk about then the end times, then we have the word eschatology. So how many of you do eschatology? Once again, how many of you do ology? You study, right? How many of you always ponder about the future and what's to come? Then all of you are eschatologists. Oh, somebody help me at First Baptist Church, please. Do you recognize how important you are in this conversation? Because Jesus would not have laid it out in Matthew 24 and the Gospels unless he knew that we were capable to understand what he was saying. And he's in this discourse, in the temple first and foremost. He's there with his disciples, right? And he walks by and he says to the disciples, you know, we're gonna, this temple you see physically speaking, I'm going to destroy it in three days. And it says, whoa, 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 Jesus. It, it, it took us quite a few years to build this temple. You're going to destroy it and, and rebuild it in three days? And of course, we know the word was talking about spiritually. Because he will be crucified. He'll be buried on, on, on Friday. And he'll be resurrected on Sunday. Somebody says, Sundays are coming. Because when he was buried on Friday, he destroyed man-made temples. Hebrew says, God doesn't dwell in temples made by hands. So he destroyed sin, evil, the man-made structure of hate and violence. And guess what he did when he was resurrected? He brought a new covenant of grace, of mercy, of love 
amen, of a spiritual journey into the promise he gave to us of his eternalness with him in heaven. So that's my introduction to you, because the disciples is inquiring, and if I was to reread for you what Cassie read for us earlier on, in chapters 23 of Matthew, you've got to open your Bibles, in, in Matthew 23, verse 37, Oh Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, can I dare say? Oh Russia, oh Russia, oh Ukraine, oh Ukraine, oh Canada, oh Canada. Oh world, oh world. Who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you? Nobody wants to hear the truth about your theology. Nobody wants to listen to the eschatology because we've got plans. And he says, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings? Jesus wants to gather us for understanding as his children. And he's saying it right here, but you were not willing. The church is even divided over this. Look, your house is left to your desolate. Songs familiar? How many homes today are desolate? Maybe physically we see in Ukraine. Maybe some parts of the world people are on the streets right here in Toronto. But what about the spiritual desolation? Our spiritual desolation away from who we are, knowing who we are in God. Just a simple question that's not even realizing we're all theologians because we are desolate in our understanding of our spiritual anointing that we have with Christ. And you do have anointing. And he says, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Sound like a Nisa Sunday morning service. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, let's continue on with my other... Ideas here for you because that's I'm going to go back to Matthew 24 if we have time, but we're going to take our time the next few weeks. Is that okay with you? So let's introduce the whole idea because Jesus is coming again. The Bible is clear that the return of Christ is certain. John 14 verse 13 says this. John 14 13. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you unto myself. Amen. All right, now, if he's coming again, according to a recent survey, do you, do you know that two-thirds of North Americans believe that Jesus Christ is coming again? That's good news, right? Two-thirds. But of that two-thirds, most believe he's coming again in their lifetime. Today. How many believe that Christ could possibly come in your lifetime? In our lifetime? Well, some of you aren't too sure, right? And rightfully so, because if the promise was made for 2,000 years now, and we're here in 2022, the possibility is we could still have a whole generation yet to come with much more unfolding before us. But we're going to get there very shortly. All right, we're going to get there in, in the next little while. Because the survey says, right, the second coming of Christ, many believe he'll return in our lifetime, even though theologians, who are they? Differ on the details. Are you Baptist? Are you Pentecostal? You, are you from the Caribbean? Were you raised in Nova Scotia in Canada? All of these factors change your concept of, of the study of eschatology. So some of you might believe in the tribulation. Is it mid-tribulation where Christ will come and, and, and take us away and then the tribulation starts? Or is he going to have some tribulation first three and a half years and then in the middle, boom, we're taken away and caught up like Thessalonians tells us. Or is it going to happen all the way? Are we in the tribulation right now? So our eschatology as theologians differs depending, but all we know this much fact, okay? Irregardless, we all know and agree that Jesus is coming again. And why do we know that? Well, we know that because the Bible is very clear. One quarter of the Bible refers to Christ coming again. Would you believe for every, every one time you see his first coming, you'll see in Isaiah, you will see in Genesis, you will see the prophecies all over there, Ezekiel, that Christ is going to come. And every time you see a prophecy of his returning, like we had for Christmas recently gone, there is eight more times reference his second coming. It's important. Important enough that Jesus spells it out in Matthew 24. Now, the least people that had to be convinced of his return were his disciples. Would you agree? The most people, the most to convince is us. The further you are from the first century when Jesus spoke in Matthew 24 is the more doubtful you'll become. So the closer you are to the first, second, third, fourth century moving along, you, have, you are much more convinced that what Jesus said 
was truthful as opposed to we now, the last generation, we may have some doubts. And the world, generally speaking, have a lot of doubts because we have not portrayed this gospel story in the way the world should believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. Because most of us don't behave as Jesus Christ is coming again. Ah. Acts chapter 1 verse 11 starts off the process for us. In Acts chapter 1 verse 11, and you'll see, uh, I have the verse up there for you. He says, men of Galilee. Now this is Jesus in the book of Acts, in the fourth gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's, he's, his life story unfolds for us. Matthew 24 and the end of Mark and uh, Luke, he also spells it out for us. But here we are, beginning the church era, but Jesus has just crucified, buried, resurrected. He spends 40 days with a bunch of people, including his disciples, and now they're standing, waiting to see what's going to happen. And Jesus summons them, and now Jesus is preparing to depart from the earth. We just talked about this in John chapters 14 earlier on. Remember that he will send the comforter, the Holy Ghost, the parakletos, and the hegos, hegios pneuma. Now he says this, but he's standing there. I want to, you to picture in your mind that you're standing there with Jesus. And you're now anticipating the world is going to be controlled by Jesus. Power is going to reign on him. And with his ascension, he starts to float in the air. I dare any of you to tell me you weren't trying to grab his legs. Yo, Jesus, where are you going? Wait for me. Where are you going? You can't leave us now. The Romans are going to come after us. Secularism is going to come after us. Social media is going to come after us. Technology is going to take over our world. Dictators are going to try and run the world for us, Lord. Come, wait, wait, wait. And I bet you any money, all of you will be doing the same thing. I suspect his disciples are all standing there in bewilderment. Where are you going? But Jesus ascends. And look what he says. Men of Galilee. The two angels comes and stands beside them. Men of First Baptist and women of First Baptist Church. Men and women of the 21st century. He says this. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus. Alos is the word for like another, like the Holy Spirit. This exact, this same Jesus. He says this. He who has been taken from you into heaven will come back. Heko is the word Greek. Come back. We'll get there in a moment. He's going to come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Are you looking for your Jesus then? In your eschatology? Are you hoping that you'll see him in your time? Because in the first century, the disciples thought he'd come back during their time. Especially when Nero destroyed the temple in 70 AD. That was some 30 years or 40 years after Christ was resurrected. Israel, Jerusalem was demolished with fire and burnt by the Romans. And of course you would think that was the end. And time rolls on and Constantine showed up in the 3rd century. In the 3rd century the Roman Catholic Church has to take over and we start to see all kind of isms going on between east and west within the Roman Empire of fighting and struggling. By the 6th century, Islam starts to rise up with power from Saudi Arabia. It starts moving in. Every time these different factions take place, people are wondering, is this the end? Is Christ coming soon again? The Reformation takes place in the 16th century and much more that goes on. The 16th century, of course, what happens? Schism like you wouldn't believe. They start burning people at the stake because of their faith. Because the German monk, who, who's Martin Luther, says, the just shall live by faith. People got to read their word for themselves. And we invent the printing press. And the printing press exposes the word for you in Aramaic and Hebrew. And you start reading the word for yourself. Oh my goodness. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. He, we just read this for the first time in the 16th century because I was relying on the priests telling me. And the evolution of this preparation for Christ's coming kept moving along the way where we get to World War I, we get to World War II, and do I dare say possibly World War III. And every time some dictator like Stalin, like Hitler, do I dare say like Putin, do I dare say like anybody who is against God, we start wondering, is he the Antichrist? Is this the end of the world? Christ, are you coming now? That's my introduction to you.
as we begin our time together of understanding. Because what Jesus says in this passage is, I'm going to come again. That's the bottom line. And he says, my question is, what has the expectation gone for us in 2022? Where is your high expectation to see Jesus return? Are you what? Are you distracted with the world's distractions and attractions? First century, sixth century, 16th century, 20th century? My mom was born around the First World War in, in the 19, uh, early 1900s, right? And having all of said that, right? Now we have 22, 2022, and we are distracted and attracted to things that remind us that Jesus might take a bit longer. Why? Because we're relying on our own power, on our own self-gratification. And what are some of those things? Well, look at the screen and you see what some of those things are. Because world of distractions and attractions. Our world has become full of distractions and attractions. Do you see what some of those things are? Do you see the one in the middle moving around? That's your biggest distraction and attraction. It's your little God. It's your little God because it's omnipresent, omnipotent, and it's omniscient. Come on, pastor, don't be so sacrilegious. Absolutely small, O oh, omni, as opposed to large, O oh, God. But God is omnipresent everywhere. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. God is omniscient, all-knowing. And God is omnificient. He's all what? Creative. Your cell phone is omnipresent. It can be in Australia right now, and you can see what's happening. Yes, somebody. Right? It's omnipotent, all-powerful, absolutely. Lies and deception through your social media and functionality can cause hate and destruction in the world. It's powerful, absolutely. And it's all-knowing. Google the word eschatology on your phone, and you'll see what you'll get. A whole list. Google my name, you'll see what you get. You'll see all about, all about Pastor Gibbs. So it's, it, it mimics, and look at, look at the question mark, the family structure, broken down. Gender identity, we don't even know what it is anymore, right? Social media, destroying us. Those are our friends. The phone is more friendly than your neighbor next door. I, I know my friends on Facebook more than I know my next door neighbor. And what about the guns and the violence? What about the war? And what about shopping and spending and materialism? And what about fake news? And what about the games we put our children to play? I want to know why at 14 years old they can shoot somebody with a gun. I guarantee that 14-year-old kid was playing video games of war and violence and shooting when he was four, five, six, seven, eight. I guarantee you I can tell you a story for every child who is murderous on the streets. Painful stuff when you think about it. And that's the world we're living in today. And then we bring it home to ourselves because our 21st century world is changing in a way that challenges us to be aware of the times we are living in. And granted, there may be a difference of opinion, but one thing we can be assured and we agree on, Christ is coming soon. And the word tells me no one knows about that day or the hour. That we'll come back to that. That's Jesus speaking. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father knows now, Jesus knows in his spiritual divine nature, but in his incarnate human nature, he doesn't know. And I told you last week, in this season, Jesus is not just sitting at the right hand of the Father, according to Ephesians. I believe he's standing up and he's ready to make his move. I believe so. And I believe, I, I do believe that it's eminent. The already and the not yet. Now, that's our theme. So let's move into our theme now. The already and the, and the, and the not yet. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 gives a very powerful passage. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You hear that? God raised up Jesus from the dead empowered him to be resurrected. And then when he was ascended in the book of Acts chapters 1 verse 11, when he was ascended, the word says he went and sat at the right hand of the Father. Here is Jesus. If he's at the right hand of the Father, then the Father is on his left side. You agree? Yeah. Rotina, come and stand right next to me. So that's God. That's Christ. He's on the right side of the Father. If we are sitting with Christ in heavenly places, uh, who wants to come? Lorena, come and sit near to me. Well, no, just, just pretend. Yeah, just stand. So there we are. 
There is the picture in Ephesians that we are given in chapters 2. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and we are sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There is the picture for you and I. It's the already and the not yet. If you want to talk to Jesus, look left. Look left, Lorena. <laughs> Thank you all. All you have to do is know the already and the not yet. You are already sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Somebody say hello. So the already and the not yet is both the unknown and yet the eminent. The unknown means that I don't know when I'll be physically sitting in heavenly places. But eminent means it's going to happen and I'm spiritually already there. Or it's the unexpected yet sure. Surprise! But it is a guarantee. As Ephesians chapter 1 says, a down payment of predestination that God gives to us. So we are already sitting with him and we are already in the imminent and the surety. But the word is, the real word is already and not yet. Let's talk about the already and not yet because modern day theologians is using the word and it's a sudden, sudden already and not yet. Suddenly we will be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye and we shall be caught up to meet him in the air. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So the verse I want to leave with you here, and I want to give you a powerful one at the very end. i got to pick it up in the next couple of weeks because I haven't even gotten to Matthew 24 yet. Matthew 24 verse 44 is our verse, our theme verse for the already and the not yet. The sudden, unknown, eminent appearance that we are anticipating of this Jesus, our Savior. And it says... So you also must be ready. Because the Son of God, or the Son of Man in this case, will come at an hour when you do not expect him. We are so distracted and attracted and mesmerized by a chaotic world that I hope you don't forget to live in the expectancy of your Savior. My responsibility is to remind you to live in the expectancy of your Savior. And this is what Jesus is affording all of us to do. I'm not going to continue on with the coming. We'll talk about what that coming and the signs mean from the Greek uh, words that Jesus used. But I want to give you that there is a sense in which God's kingdom is already in force. Do you know that? That this already and not yet, where God, Christ, and the believers are already, the kingdom has already come. Do you know why the kingdom came? Because when Jesus came to earth in the form of man, that he brought the kingdom of God with him. That's when we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on as it is in Hello, somebody. You might think a war-torn world of evil and violence and crime and people dying and all that stuff. The kingdom is right here. And guess where it is? It's inside of you. You are the kingdom of God. When you walk and you move and you mix with your friends and you orchestrate the word of God in your life and how you model yourself, that is the kingdom moving in and through a war-torn evil world. And you are the expression of the kingdom of God. That's why I told you we're theologians. We're all sitting in a pew watching me preach or deliver every week and you think that I am the expression of God. No, I am not. You are. We are the expression of God in the way we walk in obedience to him and we do his theology and his eschatology in our personal lives. Now, if you want to read the word of God when you come to Sunday morning, well, that's a different story. If you don't pray till you come to church, that's a different story. All right? Then that, that's your problem. But as a follower of Christ, you are the theologian. You study God and you study his plans for us in the future. Let me wrap it up for you because time is moving along. All right? There is a sense in God's kingdom already in force. Hebrews 2, chapter, verses 8 to 9. Hebrews 2, verses 8 to 9 says this. 
At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. I'm reading in the ESV. But think about this. You just saw a word, the now, the already and the not yet. So the already is the now. And the already is that we are what? We are now see Jesus crowned with glory. Do, do you see Jesus crowned with glory? That's the already. And if he is crowned with glory, you are crowned with glory too. You are crowned with many crowns. And rule all things in righteousness. We are crowned with Jesus Christ. And then the other one is that, and do you see the not yet? The not yet is in the implications of, of B. Not everything has been subjected to Christ yet. We see him for a little while. That's the glory that we see in him. Namely, Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of his death. And we are anticipating that return. Now, there's more to come there, okay? But I want to suggest to you, and you see a cross-reference of others there, but I want to leave this with you. In these last days, what you see unfolding, you need to run like hell. I didn't say run to hell. Because some people are running to hell. Now, I'm only using the word run like hell to play on the term. But it's actually run from hell. Don't give in to the distractions and the attractions. Run like hell. And then what you're going to do? You're going to run to heaven. In fact, those stairwells, that's the, that's, the, that's the stairs. Hit enter. That's the stairs, right? And you're going to climb those stairs just... Hit enter, my sister. Hit enter. That's the stairs just like Jesus. And you're going to climb those stairs. You're going to move up because you're going to run to heaven. Amen? Now, everybody learn this Greek word for me. Maranatha. Maranatha. I'm going to read the last verse in Revelation chapters 22, and then I'm going to come back to Matthew 24 next week for you because I want to talk about the signs. What about the signs? The simeon in the Greek word. The simeon means similarity, means of things you will observe and recognize in the time you're living in right now. The simeon, the signs that are before us right now. What are those signs? And we'll talk, we'll break them down. In fact, do some research for me. I'm going to ask one of my young people to do research. I want you to go and find out all the wars in the world. I want to know about them. And then I want to know about all the peace treaties. There's been more peace treaties than wars. And yet we have no peace. And you will never have peace until the Prince of Peace. Revelations 22. Look what Jesus says. <laughs> this is at the very end of Revelations. And we will get to Revelations, by the way, in time as well. Okay? We'll get there. We're going to get to Daniel very briefly. We're going to get to Matthew 24 again. We're going to get to Revelations and unpack a few things for you for the next little while. But my introduction is long, but I'm preparing you for something to come. All right, but Jesus, is, uh, it, John is in the Isle of Patmos. He just gave us Revelations, tw 22 chapters of Revelations, of warning of all that's to come. And then he says this, verse 20. He who testifies to these things, who's the he? John is speaking, but who's the he? Jesus. So John, at the very end of chapter 22, is saying, He, Jesus, who just gave me all the visions I just had through all the texts of, of Revelations, He, Jesus, is testifying that all these things, as he says, and this is what he says. Mine is a red letter in my Bible. He says, Yes, I am coming soon. Maranatha is the Greek word. Yes, I am coming soon. And then the, John says at the end, Amen, come Lord Jesus. And we say, when we say Maranatha, what do we say? Even so, come Lord Jesus. Jesus is coming soon. Coming to a movie theater near you. <laughs> the end. Uh-huh. Rotina says it's the first episode. It's going to be a series. 
There's going to be a series. It's absolutely. Amen. God bless you in your anticipation of what's happening, okay? I couldn't get more further into what my conversation with you, but we will. We're going to talk about what, what does it mean by wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes in diverse places. And how often, oh, by the way, part of the research with my youth is going to be how many earthquakes have we had in the world? How big have they been? How many famines do we have in the world? Are you listening, young people? Hello, young people. I'm going to be sending you all an email, and I want you all to research for me and come back. I may, I may even question you if I have to. How many wars we've had? How many peace treaties we've had? How many earthquakes we have there been? How many famines have we been? I want you to give us the facts to see how we evolved from the first century to where Jesus spoke all these things to where we are in 2,000 years later. Is it worse? Is it better? Has it, has it become stronger? Is it because we have more communicative knowledge to understand? Because in the first century, there was no communication. Right? Now, boom, boom, boom. We, in fact, it's way too much information. And I can't believe those reporters, in the middle of a war, they're standing up with bombs going on behind them, and, they, and we're seeing real life in a war? Are you crazy? Anyways, we keep the faith, all right? But that's what our advanced world has given to us. Way too much information that causes us to be distracted from the truth that Maranatha, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Father, receive this word and impress it upon our hearts, Lord, to become the theologians and the eschatologians that we are called to be, to study you, God, and to learn of you more, and to study of the times we're living in, to anticipate with expectancy, Lord, the already and the not yet. We are already sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, but we're not quite there yet until you return and redeem us back to yourself. Thank you for the word. And thank you for the hope we have in you in a war-torn world, Lord. We invite your presence with us to come and fill this place. Lord, I pray for those who are listening and for those who need to know you in a special way, for those who probably are fearful and concerned about the times we're living in, to have hope. And may you transform them, Almighty God. Because Jehovah, Almighty God, we trust you today. We believe that you are the Savior, the God of miracles, the God of wonders. Amen? So wherever you are, wherever you are, receive him.